She's a multimedia artist and she was uh, trained in painting, but she also does video and installation. She has shown internationally, um, including uh, the Tate St. Ives, the Leon Biennial in France, uh, Parasite in Hong Kong, and um, she was also shortlisted for the Hugo Boss Asia Art Award. I'm looking forward to hearing about her work as co-founder of the Collective Art Labor, and um, as social practice becomes part of the artistic landscape, uh, her organization develops art projects that benefit the community. So like Pioneer Works in Brooklyn or Tim Rollins in KOS, here we have um, another example in which art moves out of the gallery and into the community. So please join me in welcoming um, uh, Chow Nuan Phan to tonight's discussion. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here speaking uh, to you. And uh, I currently uh, uh, in Hanoi uh, for an exhibition. And um, uh, it's uh, very lovely to uh, meet you all here today. And I would like to uh, talk a little bit about my practice in overall, including painting, video installation, uh, and many sculptural works. So I will start the share screen now so we can begin uh, the lecture. So I, uh, I was trained as a painter in the University of Fine Arts um, in Ho Chi Minh City. And my original major was in traditional Vietnamese lacquer. Um, the school that I went to is quite a conventional school that's uh, taken the curriculum from the Eco de Buza from the French colonial time. So uh, the kind of uh, education that I received in Vietnam was um, actually very conventional, but somehow it gave me a kind of um, technical and uh, conceptual thinking about what painting could be from another culture and from another perspective. And uh, at the beginning of the slide, I put uh, one of the paintings that I did for an ongoing series called Dream of March and August. And this painting uh, is uh, executed by uh, watercolor and pigment on silk. Um, and uh, in the next slides, I would uh, show how the, the process of painting has involved, evolved from, um, from lacquer to silk and other materials. And since uh, 2017, I have the opportunity to to be under the mentorship with uh, with the American video and performance artist Joan Jonas, and and I was uh, um, her mentee for two years in two thousand sixteen and two thousand seventeen, which I learned so much about moving image making, and it actually has um, has provided me the the confidence to combine many um, mediums inside one project. So um, from being mainly a painter, I moved on into moving image making. And since then, I always try to combine both um, multimedia uh, video installations uh, with um, painting or sculptural elements in order to provide a, a broader sense of thinking about storytelling. And uh, this industry, you would see um, 
uh, the um, installation uh, installation view from um, my piece that I show in the Venice Biennale this year. Uh, and the video is called First Rain Risole. And it talks about um, my uh, concern about the Mekong River, one of the largest river that ran through many countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, it started in the um, in Yunnan in China, in Tibet, and then go to Yunnan, and then it's go uh, downwards to to Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and it ends up in Vietnam before it reached the Pacific Ocean. And my works for the past few years has been exploring the history, the geography, and the environmental impact on this region. Um, and uh, I think I would show a short clip from this a new video first when Rusale, so I will give the screen to to Evan so he can play the video for me. From that short clip, the, the whole duration of the video is 16 minutes, but I show a part when I um, I clearly demonstrate a very usual way, way of working is to uh, work with um, uh, children or adolescents and also to combine um, some animation uh, in between the moving uh, foot images. Uh, and the animation I created uh, in a very simple and basic uh, method is almost like a, a stop motion combined by uh, multiple uh, watercolors or ink painting. And um, the video first friend Frisole kind of explore a, a very under discussed uh, narrative, uh, a part of history between um, Vietnam and Cambodia. And I used the uh, um, uh, the modern movement in architecture in Vietnam, in the south of Vietnam and Cambodia to, to kind of 
demonstrate this this topic um, because during the um, during the Vietnam War, when the south of Vietnam, where uh, where I indeed came from, was was called the Republic of Vietnam, and uh, uh, it is a different regime from the north, which was a uh, uh, so like a socialist republic. In in the south, it was backed by the Americans, and it was a democracy. And at that time, in the south of Vietnam, the economic uh, developed. Uh, very rapidly, uh, which involved many uh, new constructions. And we have a style of um, kind of modern architecture that preference um, modern architecture history from the West, uh, a lot from France, a bit from America, but we change it and we uh, adapt a few elements that make it suitable for a tropical climate, which uh, only uh, we have monsoon half of the year would be raining every day and half of the year is dry so we change this kind of architecture become almost like so-called like tropical architecture with elements like uh, sun shades uh, brisole, uh, uh sun blocks in order to uh, cool the building and prevent the building from direct sunlight and in Cambodia uh, at that time was the sand from era under the uh, reign of uh, Norodom Sihanouk. And he also a very innovative uh, ruler who indeed um, commissioned a lot of uh, uh, local uh, architects, including one of the most famous one uh, is Van Molivan, a um, uh, Cambodian architect who was trained in France and came back to Cambodia in the 50s and in the 60s and 70s, he's had built. He's like the man who built the modern Phnom Penh at the moment, at, at that moment. And somehow during the uh, Cambodian and Vietnamese war in, uh, in 1979 until the 80s, uh, Vietnamese troops came to Cambodia and uh, it was uh, a kind of problematic issues uh, relating to the history of the Khmer Rouge, but I'm not going too deep inside. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, construction by the Vietnamese in Cambodia. And there is, uh, there is I'm not sure if there is a myth, but um, one of the very famous building, one of his favorite building by Van Molivan is called the Brett Sumaramarit National Theater in Phnom Penh, or it has a short name is the Basat Theater. And um, it was built uh, in 1968. And after the Khmer Rouge ended and the Vietnamese Cup took over, there was a renovation in 1994, but during the uh, renovation some Vietnamese construction worker accidentally um, had have fire in the building so the building was heavily uh, destroyed and it was um, demolished totally in uh, 2005. So I kind of used um, this metaphor of a destroyed building for this kind of history that relates to um, colonial power such as France, capitalist power such as the US, and then uh, conflicts between neighbors like uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, but told through the eyes of uh, young girls who acted as the, each girl acted as a branch of the Mekong River before it reached the Pacific Ocean. And, um, as uh, I told you, I always try to pair the painting element with uh, the videos because I feel like I, I am more comfortable with painting as a painter in, uh, 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 at school. And um, with this series, uh, it's called Stala Noon, of course, it's also preference the kind of 
tropical climate in in Southeast Asia, and also I, um, this is the first series that I paint uh, without uh, human figure. I consider myself more like a figurative painter, but this series I um, I kind of reference the the design of the Brissolle. Uh, the architectural elements that are built mostly from concrete uh, in order to uh, provide a sunshade for modern building in Vietnam and Cambodia and even broader to countries with tropical climate like uh, Latin America such as Brazil or in, in Africa and these uh, paintings are kind of large, large scale and the, the height of the painting are um like two two twenty three and centimeters I don't know how much in inches but it is the but it is the dimension of the modular the height of the modular man that was used in Le Corbusier uh, as a measurement for modern buildings and I was kind of questioning this modular man who are actually kind of the height of a white men from the west and it doesn't count the height of women or children or people from other geography so uh, it's also a kind of questioning the idea of uh, modernism as uh, utopian as uh, bringing um, kind of basic rights and uh, uh, hygiene to people but may but it's also have its own kind of um, uh, uh, thinking about uh, who has the power yeah, it's just some close up of the paintings, and they are made using uh, watercolor uh, and pigment and uh, graphite on um, on silk. So they are kind of transparent. And this is just some reference images from the source that I I was inspired from, uh, like um, the Prisale that I used widely in uh, in Vietnam. Those buildings are built uh, during the Republic of Vietnam during uh, the Vietnam War, for example. And uh, from this image, I would like to move on another project. Um, that is uh, actually still relates to the history of uh, of Vietnam. And I think my interest in the history of my own country is basically comes from my own education in Vietnam, which was, um, I think it was very limited and somehow manipulated because we only uh, study the kind of history that are written by the winner. So we don't uh, know much about what actually happened and about minor history or collective memory. So um, these images are um, archive photographs of, um, of uh, uh, for me, it's like a kind of um, summarize of how uh, we adopt this writing system. Um, it's called, uh, uh, which means a uh, national writing system. And before we adopt the writing system using the Latin alphabet, we uh, have another writing system that we uh, borrow the Chinese character to write Vietnamese um, because we was uh, actually a Chinese colony for like more than a thousand years. So the official uh, writing language in the court was Chinese and then the local people who speak Vietnamese they use the Chinese character to depict what they need to to talk about and uh, when the French came in the 17th century there uh, there was uh, the first uh, missionaries mostly from Portuguese and some from France they came to Vietnam and started to invent uh, together with some uh, early Vietnamese Catholics, a new writing system that um, 
that use the Latin alphabet to depict the, the local language. And I think this invented system also applied to other countries like um, Malaysia, or the Philippines, uh, many in Southeast Asia. So during the French colonial time, we started to change the Chinese system into the Romanized system. And when the revolution took over and the communists took over, actually they even promote more this new writing system because they consider it's very easy for people, especially women who at the time like mostly illiterate in order to study and uh, very quickly, most people can write fluently with this uh, new writing system. And this series, um, I kind of reflects on uh, the topic that I have just mentioned about the invention of the uh, modern script. And this series is called Voyage de Rhodes. Um, and I um, I make uh, watercolor drawings on top of the book pages, and the book uh, the book is called Voyage de Rose, and the book is uh, originally written in the seventeenth century by a French Jesuit missionary called Alexander de Rose who uh, came to Vietnam in the 17th century and he traveled and he observed the, the life, daily life and the rituals of the local people. And he wrote this book, it's like a travel, uh, like a travel log uh, in which he described many things. And he also sometimes criticized the belief of the local people as, as pagan, for example. Um, and because I don't read French, so I um, I have uh, I purchased this book, uh, which is a later edition reprinted, but this book also quite old. Uh, it was printed in a uh, eighteen eighty four, so already more than a hundred years old. So basically, what I did was I uh, took away the pages and I make uh, watercolors on each pages and because I don't read French, I just guess some words. So there are a kind of um, misunderstanding and a kind of translation uh, go on in between the in between the drawings and the content of the of the book itself. So in this um, in this still you can see like one of the drawings from the book pages and the whole series is like uh, 120 drawings and I display it in a way that you can walk around it almost like an, uh, a sculpture and you can see both the front and the back of the pages. And uh, this project was, um, was also, uh, after it was exhibited, it was composed into an artist book so you can actually see how the physical originally book looked like with the drawings on them. And this project was uh, printed and supported by, by NTUCCA in, in Singapore, one of a very important contemporary art center in Singapore that was uh, founded by the Ultimate Bauer. And, uh, because I was talking about drawings and how uh, drawings and sketches is very important in my practice. I want to kind of share this uh, slide, which is not my actual work, but this is the, um, this is the photo of uh, uh, the, the drawings that a student did in the art school in, in, in Vietnam, in Saigon. So uh, every year the students are sent uh, into other locations in the country. Mostly we go to the countryside to observe the life of the people in, in the rice field or in the factory or in the market. And we are supposed to make uh, quick uh, uh, sketches using watercolor, uh, using gouache uh, and, and, 
and paint in order to depict the life of the people in, in, uh, in their basic uh, daily activities. And um, what I found interesting about this practice is uh, it has a kind of, it begins in the colonial school, but after that, when we um, have another ideology, um, uh, we have socialist realism also really focused on uh, going uh, like uh, painters and artists are actually fighter and they go out in the field and they depict the life of the people and they have to depict it in a way that the working class or the farmers could understand. So these are my work, like my student work. Um, when I was in the art school in Vietnam, I have I went to the uh, very highlands in in the north of Vietnam where many ethnic minorities uh, live, like the Hmong people, and make uh, drawings from um, from the observation of the life of the people there. And I found that uh, education is very inspiring, but also very limited. So I started to go out from the art school and I wanted to see more of what is really happening in Vietnam at the time in the late 2000s when I was the stu student. It's still, uh, I have to say quite underdeveloped, not many uh, international artists come and we still don't really have like contemporary art museums. We only have state run museums that only show very propaganda art or very traditional art. So as a student, I went out of the school and then I started to be very interested in how, what the Vietnamese American artists uh, brought back to the country. Like some of them are Vietnamese Americans, some of them are Vietnamese French. And at that time, uh, there are already some uh, Vietnamese American or Vietnamese French or come back to the country and they started to open like uh, independent out, alternative art spaces that are basically in their apartment. And they would show uh, some art from outside of Vietnam, such as I was like deeply inspired by this piece by Bruce Norman that I saw in the apartment of my artist friend who actually come from France, but he was she was Vietnamese. And uh, that was like one of the reasons seeing this piece that make me feel like I have to go out of Vietnam and wanted to explore further. And that's why I, um, I came to Singapore to study for one year. And then I came to uh, Chicago to did my MFA for three years. Um, so in Singapore, uh, I also explore with uh, performance. So my work was actually in this, like very experimental and I try to kind of um, uh, uh, work with different mediums. I'm not like shy from any mediums and I a bit like my mentor Joan Jonas who kind of work with video performance drawings and and don't limit myself to a particular medium. So this is just an image from my mentorship with her and I I visited her in in New York in her uh, apartment in in Soho, and uh, she also traveled to Vietnam and makes some work in Vietnam. So uh, in Vietnam, we produce some kites together. Uh, so she exhibited the the work that she made in Vietnam in in Gavin Brown in uh, in two thousand seventeen and recently in in Munich, in the house de Kunz. And um, this is just to uh, kind of illustrate the kind of medium that I use aside from silk. I also work with oil painting. And uh, as I told you, I consider myself more like a figurative painter. And this series are called Looking Down series. And they are painted, they are small. They are painted on, um, x-ray film backing. So they are like a sheet that is underneath the actual x-ray. And usually the sheet are thrown away, but somehow um, I found them very inspiring and somehow they carry a certain 
uh, privacy from the patient who already took the x-ray. Um, so I use them as a surface for these paintings that are uh, depicting basic uh, gesture of uh, people looking down. And they actually have a narrative. It, um, it is... Um, it is based on a, a gesture that I found uh, during the Japanese occupation in, in Indochina. So Indochina used to be a French colony that combined, is composed of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and Vietnam got independent in 1945. And uh, the Japanese uh, took over the French and they occupied Vietnam from 1943 to 1945. And, I, um, and this, uh, this particular history is somehow very, um, have been very little research. And I don't really found any official uh, documents that talk about this era. Um, so uh, because I have a project it's called mood grain in which these um, paintings are a part of. And it's, it explored the tragic famine in the North of Vietnam in 1945 that uh, believed to cause the death of two million Vietnamese. And somehow I couldn't find any archival images, official archival images of these event. So I just like uh, broader researching about the Japanese occupation in Southeast Asia as a broader subject. And when I came to Singapore, I, uh, I came across this museum of own Ford factory in which uh, where uh, the, um, the British side is surrendered to the Japanese Imperial Army and the, and the Japanese also took over Singapore and Malaya. And I particularly struck by this image, this photograph of people bowing. And uh, from this uh, photo, I have developed a painting series, but I really remove the content, the background. It's just like basic human beings uh, bowing. And, uh, and I also make a three channel video installation in black and white that have explored the topic of the famine. And, uh, uh, Evan, can you play the video? It's called Mood Grain from uh, the beginning of the video, please. Here. Um, so uh, it's like the beginning of the video is called Mood Grain. Um, the process of making the video is actually I 
I um I collected oral oral recordings of the famine victim that was collected by an historian, a Vietnamese historian, and he did the recordings of the famine victim in the early 90s and the famine happened in 1945 so at the time of the recordings the famine victims are already quite old in their 70s or their 80s and I collect some of the recordings and I use them as the script to to uh, to realize this video is actually about a uh, an imaginative story between a, a sibling, they are called March and August. And March and August are named after the poorest month in the lunar calendar, uh, because uh, we are rice cultivation country, wet rice cultivation. And we have more, mainly two seasons of rice cultivation per year. The, um, uh, the spring summer and the autumn winter so the uh in march the end of the spring is like when of the rice ran out and the new crops hasn't dried yet so usually farmers go hungry hungry same like august um and uh and the videos are also played by children actors who i they're not professional actors but actually my my cousins and some of the um, kids from the neighbor uh, villages um, in the area where my husband family come from which is a very kind of countryside of vietnam and um this piece uh was show many, many places like the shaja binale or wheels in brussels or tate sun Ives, but i think my most mem memorial uh, mem um, display of the video installation was in, in Dhaka Art Summit in, in Bangladesh uh, back in 2020, because in Bangladesh, there was also the Bengal famine. And actually I was researching a lot about the Bengal famine in this video piece. And in Bangladesh, it was paired with the, um, with the sketches and the, drawings depicting the Bengal famine that was actually um, uh, drew by the, pa the painters from Bangladesh who have become very known uh, painters in their modern movement. And these drawings are published in like communist, communist new paper. And um, some of the drawings are very graphic, like depict um, the his the situation uh, in a real realistic way, but also some of the drawings, for example, by some not for wood series, is kind of more minimal, more symbolic, and it depicts uh, the the uh, event in a more abstract way, just by sketching, uh, not stretching on the surface of the paper to create walls, a uh, walls. And I found that there are multiple ways of talking about tragic um, uh, topics without uh, being over uh, didactic or explanatory. And I found a poetry in pairing my work with these uh, iconic works from Bangladeshi artists. And just some images that I collect during the research of mood grain and the photographs of of the famine victim by Võ An Ninh are actually the only survival um, uh, visual imagery of this event. And somehow from this uh, videos and the archive photographs, I also developed a series um, of silk painting. Um, uh, it's called Dream of March and August in which I depict March and August, the main characters and the video uh, who are a uh, brother and sister and the sister passed away in the famine and the brother kind of looking in vain for her in in um in a spiritual way where she become a wandering ghost um because in asia we believe like when a person passed away uh 
for the first 49 days, she or he or she will have become wandering around like the wandering ghost before uh, after the 49 day, we will make a ceremony in which for that person to have the ability to re reincarnate. So in this series, they uh, kind of talk about this period of 49 days when the girl wanders and the boys are kind of looking for her. And uh, the, the painting are, uh, display also uh, not like conventionally they are hung uh, from a ceiling and because they are silk so you can also basically see the front and the back of the painting by looking uh, walking around at them and they are always uh, goes as a pair uh, as a pair or a diptych and this for this uh, presentation of the mood brain project in in Shanghai for the uh, uh, Hugo Boss Asian Art Award finalist exhibition, there's also a curtain, uh, like a sculpture piece that are uh, that are constructed by a uh, jute, uh, the jute stock. The jute are like a very um, uh, popular materials that are mainly grow in the Bengal area in India. Uh, that are uh, very important for the fiber production during wartime. Uh, but during the Japanese occupation, the jute uh, uh, in Bengal was disrupted. So the Japanese also forced Vietnamese farmer to uproot the rice to grow jute. And that was one of the reasons why the famine happened. So I used these materials to kind of make a very uh, abstract, um, minimal um, sculpture in which works physically as a curtain. So the viewers has to kind of pass through this uh, jute curtain in order to enter the other room in which the video are shown. Um, and I think uh, this would be the last uh, project that I would show uh, in the context of our talk uh, for us to do, uh, to cope with the time. Um, and for this particular project, I can't come back to the idea of the Mekong River and how uh, this river has been so important in terms of agricultural economy, history, and also politics. And uh, and I was particularly interested in this uh, called the Mekong Exploration Commission that was um, uh, done by a group of French explorers who actually uh, started in Saigon and then they came to Phnom Penh uh, and then to Sindrip in which they visited the Angkor Wat and deeply inspired by the architecture of the Angkor Wat. And one of the person in the, uh, one of the explorer in the group uh, has gone on to be one of the illustrator of Cambodian uh, architect and he also collect, uh, I don't know if he loot some of the ob objects and many of the objects are now in the collection of the music, Goumet in France. And uh, from this, um, from this uh, research about the Mekong Exploration Commission, I developed a piece that is called Becoming Alluvium. And indeed, they, um, in my work, I am deeply inspired by literature. Um, at the beginning, before being a painter, I really wanted to be a writer because at that time in Vietnam, we don't really have any ideas about what being a visual artist could be. It's very vague. Somehow I feel like being a writer is something that is more concrete. So I always love reading and somehow this, this love for literature always comes into the um, video and the painting works, for example. Um, uh, in becoming alluvium, I um, I inspired by the writing of um, uh, 
Italo Calvino in his Invisible Cities, also by the poetry of, of uh, Tagore and the fiction of, not, not like fiction, more like a memoir of Marguerite Duras, who, who a French writer, uh, but actually spent her childhood in, in Indochina and in the Mekong uh, Delta in Vietnam. And also from the folklore, uh, from the folklore in in Vietnam and Cambodia, and somehow I feel like there are also a distance between these literary works. Some of them from the West and become very known, but the folklore from um, the local region, like the folklore from Laos or Cambodia or Vietnam, are very. Uh, under uh, published and they are not translated they are not well collected so in my work somehow i always try to bring the the literature source from well-known uh, works and the works that i found very relevant but not uh, explore well enough and i make many many uh, watercolor sketches uh, when i make uh, the video piece um so i think we can play uh the uh, Evan, can you play the part from becoming alluvium from yeah from the eleven thirty minutes? Yeah, so um, the drawings are served for the purpose of animation, but also um, for brainstorming the content of the video. And the video are called Becoming Alluvium, and it's, um, it's a single channel video piece that explore the, the myth of the Mekong River through the, uh, through the eyes of children. And it uh, at the beginning, 
uh, it was uh, the break of a hydropower dam that caused the death of uh, children in a local village. And one of the uh, kids also gone through multiple reincarnations. And in one of the reincarnations, he uh, was a Khmer princess. And in that animation part, I was kind of um, preference a Khmer folktale about a princess who wanted to have jewelry made from the morning dew, but of course it was impossible. And uh, it talks about human then wishes in order to control nature and it and, and in this particular case to control the river because the Mekong River has so many resources and in recent decades it has been um, developed rapidly uh, of the hydropower dams in which indeed brought a lot of economic uh, development to the countries uh, surrounding this river, but it's also affected the environment deeply and especially the people who are not having the advantage from this are the people or the fishermen are the villagers who are living in the area. So uh, just some uh, display uh, photographs from this one from Tate and Ives, this one from the Juan Miro population, and the one on the right is from Wheels in Brussels. And uh, to accompany this uh, video, I also uh, have a work, it's called Perpetual Brightness, and it's worked like a stand, standing screen. And one side is, uh, uh, six wooden panels uh, using uh, Vietnamese lacquer on wood, uh, depicting like like an abstract abstracted map of the Mekong River view from above, and somehow this map is like uh, not. Uh, uh, I also uh, kind of questioning the idea of map making because on map is always solid, it's always stable, but indeed because we have monsoon. So when it was rain, uh, the rainy season, the change, the shape of the river changed. The whole Mekong Delta was covered in water, but because of the control of the dam and the climate change nowadays, the the natural uh, flooding of the monsoon is not really happening. We built a lot of dikes in order to prevent water from coming in the rice paddies. So. Uh, uh, so I also question this idea about the fluidity of water and the, and the concreteness of, of map making. And the front side of the, of the standing panels uh, are also um, watercolor and pigment on silk have depicting my uh, personal thoughts about the topic of the Mekong River and it was how, how it was displayed. You can also walk around and see both the front and the back. And it's also uh, paired with another, another painting. The seventh panel was an abstract and separate painting that I hung on the wall. And it also kind of talk about the idea of alluvium, uh, the alluvium that nurtured the land and it has uh, multiple colors, earthy colors, red colors. And um, uh, I would like to use this uh, abstract image at the end of the presentation. And uh, it would be lovely to hear your input and questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you so much for a, a wonderful presentation and a complex synopsis of your mixing the poetic with history and unfortunate events. Um, here in America, we do not learn everything either about what has happened. Uh, the Vietnam War was extremely controversial uh, during the 1970s. Um, but at the same time, um, many of the things that you're talking about in terms of the history of Vietnam were left out of the equation. 
And um, it's really very moving to hear about the ways in which uh, famine, colonialism, uh, illiteracy, um, starvation, et cetera, um, were part of this. Um, also, many of your pieces, you date them with a specific date and then say they're ongoing. This seems to be an interpretation of reincarnation in the sense that a, an idea or a work of art is never really finished, that one comes back to it at another, at another time. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the phrase you used called socialist Buddhism? Uh well, I, I, I think I may be uh, not in the talk, I don't really use uh, socialist Buddhism, but uh, socialist realism. Oh, uh, socialist realism. Okay. That's understandable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, because we've seen that. And it's also interesting what you had said about people having exhibitions in their apartments. Uh, this has certainly happened in the Soviet Union and many of the Eastern Bloc countries where socialist realism was the only accepted form of art, but in order to practice a more avant-garde perspective, uh, little communities formed in private homes. So it's interesting to hear that too in Southeast Asia. Um, now, let's see if we can have some uh, questions here. Here's a question. I have been interested in vernacular architecture in C, S-E-A, but specifically Malaysia, as well as colonial history. How do you go about researching and studying archives, especially when information is deliberately destroyed or difficult to access? Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for a very beautiful and relevant question. I, I Because I'm not a trained in architect or architecture history, I would reply from a perspective of a visual artist that uh, love to do research-based project because in the context of my work, first Grand Prix Soleil, uh, it is limited to the modern movement in of architecture in, in Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, I, I think I would just uh, talk about how I do the research there. It's mostly site visits and the the project was conducted entirely during the pandemic from the night uh, 2019 to 2021. So I couldn't go to Cambodia, but I um, I have many friends, uh, Cambodian friends who provided me with uh, resources such as uh, Pen Sere Patna Nya, who trained an architect trained in Cambodia and who ran the Van Molivan projects because most of his buildings now are, um, some of them destroyed, some of them are still in use, but of course he is not well reserved. But there are many groups, architectural groups and artist groups that are working together to reserve and to pass the knowledge. Um, and regarding the modern movement of architecture in other regions, I have to say, I don't know much about the modern movement in Malaysia. I used to live in Singapore for two years, so I know a bit about the modern movement there. And also in the Philippines with the work of Loxin, for example. And I, I, I definitely feel like this is a movement that is like, highly developed in Southeast Asia in the 60s, in the 70s, and even the 80s. And there are not enough research about it. And actually many of the buildings has become, for us, they're like her heritage buildings, but because they are not old enough, 
to be preserved. They are still too new. But with recent uh, real estate and economic development in, in Southeast Asia, the region is developing very fast. They seem to consider to reserve the colonial building because they thought it is older, it has more history, and destroy the modern building in order for the newer buildings to took over. And for me, it is also problematic. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, do you have access to the American archives? Uh, do you mean the, the, the American archive in based in America or? Yes. Uh, uh, may, maybe not that I know of, but if you have recommendations, of course, I would love to, to study and dig into the archive. Yes, I'm sure there are archives available um, because there's also the Freedom of Information Act that had been passed. So it would be very interesting to look at some of these issues from an American perspective. So that may be a grant for you to come back to America yeah. and go to Washington, D.C. and look through the archives. We have another question here. Um, during the presentation, I was interested in the mention of looting of cultural objects within the context of French and Japanese colonialism, are you concerned about the stealing of art and cultural objects in your work as well? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for, very much. I, I thought the question is difficult, but also very relevant. I think the looting of cultural objects not only apply to the context of Vietnam or Cambodia or Southeast Asia, but a broader uh, uh, nations with a colonial history as a whole. And um, I think in, in the particular context of, of Vietnam, uh, people don't really, we don't have an of, official reaction to this. And uh, it, it indeed, it happened. Uh, I know many objects from the Khmer culture has been looted. I think the French consider it as a more original and um, advanced uh, with many artistic uh, uh, heritage. They just love it and they just brought it back to the country. <laughs> and in, <laughs> in, in Vietnam, we uh, the objects are more influenced by Chinese culture, for example. And uh, I don't wish out about it, but during visit in France, for example, I saw many like uh, sculpt like sculpture mm. of the Buddha uh, in temple, for example, uh, uh, Buddha that is uh, painted, uh, made in wood and painted in lacquer in the museum collection. And I don't really know about history of those objects, but like my artist friend have a funny comment that, Luckily, they were in France. If they were in Vietnam, they probably already being destroyed by the communists because we have something like a small uh, cultural revolution in which um, statues and uh, in temples are also being destroyed. But uh, it's just a problematic uh, comment about um, the about the effect of of colonialism and also the changing of, of ideology. And I don't really have any uh, direct response of how those objects should be treated. But I, ideally, I think uh, it's always beautiful to, to have them back to their home. As a researcher, I, I found it problematic to go to archive in in France or in the US to research about the topic of, of my country, for example. Okay, we have another question. How do you think about the formal structure of your videos in relation to the historical political content? 
when do you choose to make multi-channel videos versus single channel videos? Um, thank you very much for your question. Uh, as an artist, I think I deeply care about the formal structure of my painting and video works. And even though the works are sometimes uh, research based or historical, I never saw it as a kind of a presentation of a research. So if people uh, look at the videos and the paintings and see it as the documentary of the history of Vietnam, it is not true because I include a lot of fictions, a lot of imaginations. And in terms of the formal structure, I think I am very influenced by, um, but just like uh, the history of video in, in general, artists like uh, Steve McQueen or Joan Jonas or Bruce Nauman, Bruce Nauman or like filmmaker like the Nouveau Vague in France or like the Taiwanese New Wave. And the filmmaker that I love the most is probably uh, uh, Yasujiro Ozu from Japan and Apichapan Wirasethakun from Thailand. And I, I think I, uh, I develop a concept of the moving image as reincarnation. So even though the film seems complete, I always change them. Uh, I change the, the way I edit, I change the image, I change the way I pair them with other two dimensional works to make it always a new life that continues and breathing almost like an animated object and the choice of the multi channel and single channel is i have to say most of the time intuitive um and it also depends on time and the funding budget that i receive but i always like the idea of uh uh the moving i always love the idea of multi channel because it's really give a different from a traditional cinema in which uh, the the body of the viewer really submerged or uh, like inside the environment. And this is what I love about video installation in, in museums and art settings rather than cinema setting. Great, great answer. Well, uh, is there another question uh, out there somewhere? This is your last chance. Okay, well, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, uh, rich in history and of fantasy, and uh, certainly a mix, as I said, of the poetic with the kind of unfortunate events that transpire due to political, economic, and social interaction. So I hope you will come visit us one day and um, see our wonderful building. And if you need any help with any of your research, if we could help at all, just let us know. So thank you very much and thank you for coming so early in the morning. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending. Oh, always my pleasure to speak with you all.